the Social Change in West Asia Lecture Series, which is organized by the Department of Asian Languages and Civilizations. My name is Siobhan Shasakwari, Assistant Professor of West Asian Studies um, in Asian Languages and Civilizations. Um, and I have the pleasure to introduce today's speaker, uh, Professor Joseph Farag. Um, before I do, um, I know that most of you have been to the previous um, lectures. If you haven't been, if you've missed any of the lectures, uh, we have um, the videos of all the lectures uploaded onto our YouTube, um, the department's YouTube channel, uh, which is available through our website, um, which is asia.snu.ac.kr. So if you just go to the department website, there's a link for our YouTube channel, and you can see the lectures by Professor uh, Haitham Bahura, which was on Iraqi folklore art, the lecture by uh, Professor Pelin Bashchi, which was on Turkish uh, television, and the lecture by Professor Negar Motahedeh on Iranian cinema. And very soon we'll also have the lecture by uh, Professor Farag uploaded on um, that YouTube channel. Uh, we also do have, as uh, previous uh, occasions, do have a simultaneous translation available. So if you um, need that, pick up please um, the, uh, the earpiece uh, from up front and you'll have our excellent uh, simultaneous translators uh, version of the lecture. So um, to introduce our speaker today, Professor Joseph R. Farag is an assistant professor of Arabic literature and culture at the University of Minnesota. He was previously uh, an EUME postdoctoral fellow in affiliation with the Friedrich uh, Schlegel Graduate School for Literary Studies at the Free University of Berlin. And he was also a lecturer in Middle Eastern Literary Studies at Queen Mary University of London, where he also earned his PhD. Uh, Professor Farrick's background is in political science, so I'm actually excited. He's both Canadian and a political scientist. You know, I feel like um, I'm not the only Canadian with political science. Um, so his background is in political science and global studies. He holds uh, master's degrees in uh, Near Eastern and Near and Middle Eastern studies from SOAS University of London, and also in cultural analysis and social theory from Wilfrid uh, Laurier University in Waterloo, Ontario. Uh, his research covers the intersection of cultural production, history, and politics in the Arab world with a particular focus on the Palestinian context. His book, which is called Politics and Palestinian Literature in Exile, Gender, Aesthetics, and Resistance in the Short Story, was recently published uh, by Ivy Torres. Professor Ferg's uh, current research project looks at the imagination and portrayal of space, place, and time in Palestinian literary and cinematic works. Alongside his scholarly pursuits, Professor Farrick is also a board member of New Arab American Theater Works. The title for Professor Farrick's lecture today is Palestine and the Politics of Form, Literature After the Night. Please join me in welcoming Professor Joseph Farrick. <laughs> Thank you so much, Siavash. Um, I have to say that I've been completely overwhelmed by the generosity the, and the hospitality of um, the Department of Asian Languages and Civilizations and of Seoul. Um, mm -hmm. I hear that they're going to be having a big celebration for me this weekend somewhere <laughs> downtown, and you really shouldn't have. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this this. My talk today is going to be about um, a topic that I think is too frequently overlooked in Arabic literary studies, particularly Arabic literary studies in the Western Academy, and that's the question of Arabic literary aesthetics. Uh, too often, I think, um, the question of aesthetics is, is, is either completely ignored or subordinated under uh, issues of discourse analysis uh, when looking at Arabic literature, questions of uh, what, is, what is the role of women in literature? What is the role of the nation in literature? Uh, these tend to be much more pressing in the minds of Western Arabic literary scholars. Uh, and what's lost among that is, is, is what I think is, is the just as significant 
question of the, the question of form, the question of aesthetics in literature. And not that this is necessarily a justification for looking at aesthetics, but aesthetics is far from apolitical. And I guess that's, that's one of the core arguments that I'm making here, is that there is fundamentally a connection between um, the form in which an author writes or the form in which a text is written and um, the kind of political function or political role of that text into the society in which, into which it's intervening. Um, so I want to look at that question today with particular attention to two Palestinian authors who were active during the seminal 1948 to 1967 period. Samira Azam, um, who, uh, as I'll be mentioning, is, is woefully neglected, almost completely forgotten today, um, and her much more well-known, younger contemporary, Hassan Kenafen. Um, and what I want to do is, is demonstrate the various ways in which both authors both challenged literary consensus during the 1948 to 1967 period through their experimentation with modernist literary techniques. And finally, uh, I'll argue that the 1948 to 1967 period was formative in Palestinian literary portrayals of space, place, and time, what I call the chronotopes of exile. Now, this 1948 to 1967 period is bookended by two defeats that would stun the Arab world and alter not just the Arab political landscape, but the literary one as well. The defeat of 1948 resulted in the establishment of the State of Israel and the concomitant loss of Palestine. The shock of this defeat, in which the combined Arab armies of Egypt, Jordan, Iraq, Syria, as well as Palestinian militia were easily overcome by the armed forces of the nascent Israeli state, engendered a radical reassessment of both the political and literary um, status quo. Along with the rise of new regimes espousing nationalist ideals which emerged in the wake of 1948, Arabic literature came to be dominated by a realist literary aesthetic as a literary cultural response to the iconoclastic defeat. Two decades later, the combined Arab armies of Egypt, Jordan, and Syria would once again be humiliatingly defeated by an Israeli surprise attack. The defeat of 1967 would expose the hypocrisy and shortcomings of the newly minted Arab nationalist regimes that had taken power in the wake of, of the defeat of 1948, seriously undermining their nationalist and liberationist rhetoric. In literature, meanwhile, the defeat of 1967 brought to a definitive end the dogma of realism in Arabic literature, clearing the way for modernist experimentation in its wake. As shall become evident in my discussion of Samira Azam and Hassan Kanafani, however, Palestinian authors were among the earliest exponents of modernist experimentation, defying the dominant realist consensus of the 1948 to 1967 period. Between 1947 and 1948, the Palestinians lost their homeland, in the process of which 750,000 of, of Palestine's indigenous inhabitants more than half the population were cast into exile in what is widely and indisputably regarded as the most seminal event in modern Palestinian history, dubbed al nakba in Arabic, the catastrophe. The catastrophic defeat of 1948 sent ripples throughout the Arab world, shaking the foundations of many of the ancien regimes ruling at the time. The first decade following the Nakba saw a domino-like fall of one Arab ruler after another as popular discontent following the Nakba combined with the emergence of a cadre of young nationalist military men keen to usher in a new era of anti-colonial Arab nationalist politics. Thus a military coup took place in Syria in 1949 and Jordan's King Abdullah was assassinated in 1951. In 1952, Egypt's Free Officers Coup ultimately brought Gamal Abdel Nasser to power, while the Iraqi monarchy was overthrown by a military coup in 1958. Meanwhile, as the upheavals of the Nakba were taking place between 1947 and 1948, Jean-Paul Sartre was publishing a series of articles on the question of political commitment in literature and the author's role in and responsibility to society collected into an, in, into an influential volume in 1948 entitled Qu'est-ce que la literature, or What is Literature? 
very shortly after the publication of What is Literature in French in 1948, it was translated and published in Arabic, where it found a receptive audience. What is Literature espouses what Sartre calls literature engagée, or committed literature. Committed to what? In short, to freedom, as Sartre writes, the work of art from whichever side you approach it is an act of confidence in the freedom of men. And since readers, like the author, recognize this freedom only to demand that it manifest itself, the work of literature can be defined as an imaginary presentation of the world insofar as it demands human freedom. Elsewhere in what is literature, Sartre writes, whether he's an essayist, a pamphleteer, a satirist, or a novelist, whether he speaks only of individual passions or whether he attacks the social order, the writer, a free man, addressing free men, has only one subject, freedom. By 1950, Sartre's concept of literary commitment, translated into Arabic as iltizam, with its emphasis on freedom, had gained common courtesy among Arab intellectuals. At the time, some Arab countries had only very recently succeeded in their quests for national independence, and even then, complete autonomy was often, oftentimes curtailed. So in Egypt, for instance, the Arab world's metropole of literary and cultural thought and production at the time, Britain maintained a military presence along the Suez Canal Zone that would only be grudgingly and unwillingly withdrawn after the 1956 Suez Crisis, or tripartite aggression. Elsewhere in the Arab world, European colonization continued challenged but unabated. Finally, and perhaps most prominently, the Arab world had recently been dealt the humiliating defeat of the Nakba in 1948, the wounds from which were still raw. So in an Arab world beset by iconoclastic defeat and political turmoil, authors and intellectuals were struggling to find a place for themselves and their work. Sartre's What is Literature and his concept of literary commitment seem to provide ready answers. But Sartre's literary theory of literary commitment was not transplanted wholesale and unaltered from the Parisian left bank to Cairo, Beirut, Baghdad, or Damascus. Arab authors and intellectuals fixated upon and improvised upon two issues in particular that were absent in Sartre's text but which proved to be a pressing concern in the Arab context. Nationalism and realist literary aesthetics. The interpolation of nationalism into Sartre's discussion of literary commitment by Arab thinkers is telling of the anxiety surrounding the question of nationhood in the Arab world at the time. On the one hand, the Arab world had just witnessed the destruction of one national community, the Palestinians, while on the other hand, most of the Arab nation states that we recognize today had only recently come into being. Many of the original leaders of those newly founded states, feudal monarchs either appointed or by or dependent upon France or Britain for their authority, were being overthrown by military coups, the leaders of which espoused Arab nationalist rhetoric, of which Egypt's charismatic young leader, Gamal Abdel Nasser, was emblematic. Advocates of the new nationalist realist consensus argued that no literature that aspired to political commitment could fail to espouse nationalist ideals, given the ascendancy of Arab nationalism and the existential anxieties surrounding Arab nationhoods. Alongside this emphasis on nationalism in the Arabic interpretation of commitment, or iltizam, was another innovation upon Sartre's what is literature, the prescription of a realist literary aesthetic. Sartre himself only addresses the question of aesthetics and what is literature briefly and in passing, and even then he prevaricates. Amid Sartre's ambivalence and ambiguity on the question of literary aesthetics, Arab thinkers put forth their own doctrine of literary realism as the only valid manifestation of committed literature. In 1953, the Lebanese author and intellectual Suhail Idris founded the hugely influential monthly literary journal al Adab, which would set the Arabic literary agenda to a very large extent. Notably, al Adab took a stance explicitly advocating committed literature, stating in its inaugural uh, editorial, oh, sorry, the main aim of this review is to provide a platform for those fully conscious writers who live the experience of their age and who can be regarded as its witness. 
In reflecting the needs of Arab society and in expressing its preoccupations, they paved the way for reformers to put things right with all the effective means available. Consequently, the kind of literature which this review calls for and encourages is the literature of commitment, iltizam, which issues from Arab society and pours back into it. The reason that realism in particular should be the vehicle for this new literary sensibility is obliquely alluded to in this passage. For authors to act as witnesses to the experience of their age, for them to reflect the needs of Arab society and express its preoccupations, they must unflinchingly portray the harsh realities of the present with verisimilitude. Following the Arab Nahda, or Renaissance of the late 19th century, Romanticism had come to dominate Arabic prose fiction. Arabic literary Romanticism was individualistic, idealistic, optimistic, and confident in the relative tranquility of the status quo. In a sense, the Romantic literature of the pre-1948 period is analogous to the ancien regimes who ruled at the time. And just as those rulers would be overthrown by the post-1948 tide of political upheaval, so too would Romanticism come to be rejected. Against Romanticism's escapism, false optimism, and complacency, advocates of committed literature called for a stark realism that confronted social and national ills, and that would not balk in the face of the numerous problems afflicting the Arab world. To do this, to diagnose those national and social ills and to pave the way for reformers to put things right with all effective means available, literary production had to realistically mirror society itself. What the conflation of realism and nationalism and political commitment, uh, the conflation of realism with nationalism and political com commitment ultimately illuminates is the inseparability of form and function in the text. Just as the dominant currents of Arabic literary production are significant, so too are their countercurrents. And despite the fact that it was Palestinians who were most directly affected by the Nakba, it was also often Palestinian authors who defied literary convention in its wake. One of those early post-Nakba Palestinian literary voices was the short story author Samir Azzam. As a pioneer of Arab radio broadcasting that was flourishing in the 1950s, Azam was a prolific figure in the early post nakba period. Despite this, and despite the fact that she was one of the first seminal post nakba Palestinian literary voices, Azam and her writings have lapsed into undeserved obscurity today, concealing the important contributions she made to Palestinian and Arabic literature during the pivotal 1948 to 1967 period. Azam's writings, though largely abiding by the dictates of the post nakba realist consensus, subtly diverge from its strictures of realism at certain crucial moments. Tellingly, these tentative forays into some key tropes of modernism, particularly interiority, are most apparent when Azam addresses female subjectivity and women's role in society. Azam is best understood as a seminally proto-feminist writer that would lay a foundation for later feminist Palestinian authors such as Liana Badr and Sahar Khalife. Whereas Badr and Khalife, both self-described feminist authors, would place female Palestinian experiences of exile and displacement at the forefront of their writings, at first glance, Azam's writings seem to have little to do either with female, Arab, or Palestinian subjectivity. There are, however, some notable exceptions to this, of which her story, Khubz al Fida, Bread of Sacrifice, is perhaps the most prominent. Bread of Sacrifice depicts an ultimately doomed attempt by a group of Palestinian fighters to protect the Palestinian town in 1948. Assigned to defend the hospital, the male protagonist, Ramiz, strikes up an acquaintance with the nurse, Suad, that quickly evolves into a romance that is ultimately thwarted when Suad is fatally shot as she attempts to bring provisions to Ramiz and his men at the front lines. As the story makes clear, this blossoming romance is inextricably intertwined with the struggle to preserve the Palestinian homeland. So this is from Bread of Sacrifice. That spring, Ramiz learned about two things, 
love and war, and the first gave meaning to the second. War was not simply an enemy to kill voraciously. Rather, it was an assertion of the life of the land he loved and the woman he loved. Palestine was not only a sea with fishing boats and oranges shining like gold, and not just olives and olive oil filling the big oil jars. It was Saad's black eyes as well. In Saad's eyes, he saw all of Palestine's goodness. He saw the image of a happy home for him and a wife who would bear him young heroes and make her love the meaning of his existence. The passage, brief though it may be, is saturated by the gendered tropes of nationhood that feminize the space of homeland and cast its loss in fundamentally masculinist terms. According to this widespread discourse, it's incumbent upon the male subject to liberate the homeland, thereby simultaneously requiting the thwarted union of both man and woman and man and homeland. Notably, while the text of Bread of Sacrifice makes explicit reference to the fact that Brahmas trains female volunteers to handle weapons and fight, we are given nothing more than a glimpse of them in passing reference. Instead, the focus is on Soad, the archetypal nurturing female, a Palestinian Florence Nightingale figure who tends to wounded Palestinian fighters and knits them clothing in her spare time. It is this woman, and not the ones he trains to fight, who gives meaning to Ramiz's struggle to preserve Palestine. It is in her eyes that he saw all of Palestine's goodness. And crucially to a gendered national Palestinian narrative that so often equates women with their wombs, it is Suad who would bear him young heroes. Significant too is the equation of love for woman and war for homeland. The first gave meaning to the second. Azem ultimately confines Suad to the traditional role of nurturer and the female embodiment of the land for which Ramis is fighting. And while her death during the attempt to bring food to the male soldiers inverts the usual masculine discourse of the male figure as provider and martyr, it simultaneously reinforces the discourse of stable female subjectivity and a feminized homeland awaiting male return by having Saad's body interred in Palestinian soil. So Bread of Sacrifice adheres to the conventions of realism, striving to portray the desperation and futility of Palestinians' attempts to defend their homeland. Moreover, there is little in Bread of Sacrifice that hints to even a proto-feminist reappraisal of women's societal role and of social attitudes towards women. For this, we have to look to another short story, Nasib, Fate, in which Azam focuses on an individual woman's agency set against collective patriarchal authority, in which Azam implicates women and men alike. The entirety of the action in Fate takes place in the time span of an unnamed bride's walk up the aisle on the day of her wedding. Through flashback and the omniscient narrator's explication of the bride's inner thoughts, we learn of her initial rejection of the marriage, followed by ambivalence, and finally, acquiescence. The opening lines of fate ironically portray women as burdens that patriarchal authority must bear, both unquestioned and unquestioningly. Take her. My authority over her ends here and now. Her father had not actually said anything of the sort when <laughs> handing her over to her bridegroom at the church door, yet that was the feeling she had as she was taking the hand stretched out towards her, and as she started to make her way through the assembled congregation who cast basketfuls of lilies at her feet. The bride's individual agency is occluded here, as authority is passed from father to bridegroom. This conspicuous omission of the bride's own sentiments on the day of her wedding casts a pall over the ceremony from the story's outset, a foreboding that dissonantly contrasts with the wedding guest's joyful tossing of flowers. The question of individual women's agency is summarized in the bride's ability to say yes or no to the marriage, a decision over which the bride herself agonizes as depicted in flashbacks throughout the story. This is just one example. Oh, how confused she was, wavering between saying yes or no, and how feeble she felt in the face of that strange power which her mother's female friends agreed to call fate, 
Earlier, as a schoolgirl, she had consistently refused to recognize the existence of this reactionary word in her vocabulary, a word which had filled her mother's and her grandmother's minds before her time. But she did not subscribe to the school of believers in fate, for fate is the drug of those whose will is broken, and she was not, not one of them. But was it really within her power to rebel against fate, which had led her to where she was now, without any significant resistance from her, and without the least attempt on her part to prove herself or to assert her right to choose? Still, what was more strange in a way was that she had not said no. Azan is careful not to portray the bride as being forcefully compelled to marry the unnamed man. Rather, she is cajoled into doing so, most notably by her elder female relatives, and finally acquiesces out of material considerations, her husband-to-be is wealthy. In doing so, Azam complicates the simplistic portrayal of Arab women as the passive victims of Arab male patriarchy, instead implicating older women of the earlier generation in the propagation of retrograde societal customs, and women of the younger generation for acquiescing to such retrograde customs. Significantly, the older women's resignation to fate depersonifies patriarchy, elevating it to an inescapable metaphysical force rather than a social phenomenon to be confronted and combated. The bride's initial rejection of fate as the drug of those whose will is broken gestures to the younger, gener younger generation's potential to challenge their elders' customs but that subversion is ultimately thwarted by the bride's preference for material comfort. In the climactic ending to fate, the bride, seems to once, the bride seems to once again find her voice answering no to the priest's question of, do you take so-and-so to be your husband? However, she's drowned out by the din of the congregant's celebration. Overwhelmed by her confusion, tiredness, and nervousness, she began repeating it saying no aloud, shouting no, but the cry was blotted out. No one heard her, not the priest, not the congregation, not even this man standing next to her. It was lost in the reverberations of a sound that engulfed the church, the voice of all those present sealing her marriage with the wedding hymn, with glory and dignity, he wed her. The bride's individual will is once again silenced by the overpowering authority of the collective while the wording of the phrase, he wed her, reinscribes agency onto the male subject, while the bride remains a passive object, despite her unheard protestations. It is significant that Azam should depart from her usual mode of realism in addressing female subjectivity and social patriarchy. The interiority prevalent throughout fate, through its emphasis on the bride's psyche and her internal deliberations, aesthetically mirrors the domestic confinement that the story suggests will be the bride's ultimate fate. Juxtaposed with the cajoling of her elder relatives who are heedless of the bride's own wishes, or the din of the gathered congregants that drowns out the bride's belated and ultimately futile attempt to alter her submission to fate, the narrative of the bride's internal monologue becomes the only space in which she can be heard. The irony, of course, being that she is heard only by us, the readers, rather than the society that surrounds her. But ascribing to Azem too radical a feminist politics would be a mischaracterization of her works. As demonstrated by Azem's use of masculinist tropes in, of nationhood and bread of sacrifice, and similarly, the narrative of fate is told not in the first person by the bride herself, but by a third-person omniscient narrator. In a narrative fundamentally about authority and who gets to be heard, the authoritative position of the third-person narrative in explicating the bride's own thoughts is impossible to ignore. Rather than the bride articulating her own experiences and sentiments, the character of the bride is once again subordinated to the authoritative figure of the omniscient narrator thereby undermining the potential of a more radically feminist text. Subsequent pal fe Palestinian feminist authors, such as the aforementioned Liana Madr and Sahar Khalifa, would build upon Azam's tentative forays into modernism with interiority and first-person stream-of-consciousness narration, constituting central elements in the aesthetic politics of their writings. However, both Bread of Sacrifice and Fate 
are outliers in Assam's rule in directly addressing the Palestinian